Thanks for joining us. We're going to give it just another minute or two um, as people come in, but we're really excited to kick off our first speaker series and um, just appreciate you all taking time out of your day to, to join us as well. So um, I am, my name is Megan. I work for Gold Crown. I've been at the foundation for about 12 years. I work primarily in our marketing and sponsorship department, but I am also one of the staff members that was tasked with creating our health huddle. So it's been a lot of work, but it's been a lot of fun too. And we're really just trying to reach more families in the area. Um, we are always open for suggestions too. So if there's ever any content ideas or program ideas or anything along the health huddle lines that interest you, you can always send an email to healthhuddle at goldcrownfoundation.com. Um, so always feel free to do that if you would like. Um, with that being said, I would like to introduce our um, host for tonight. Her name is Mimi Renadin and she works at Children's Hospital. She is a sports physical therapist there. Um, she also is board certified in sport and, sport and um, orthopedics physical therapy. She has a master's in sports performance psychology from the University of Denver and um, her biggest passions, she enjoys taking the mental and physical aspect of sport and putting that together um, to anywhere from return to sport and rehab. So we're gonna kind of touch on some of those things today. Um, just a quick few reminders before I turn it over to her, please keep everything muted if you can. Um, if you do have questions, please feel free to add them in the chat. Um, Mimi will be answering them at the end. So you can do that. And then um, also at the end, we do have a brief survey that I'll put in the chat as well for you to take and we'll also send it by email. So um, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Mimi. All right, thanks, Megan. Um, let me just make sure my screen is shared. Um, there we go. Oops, first slide. Okay, does that look right to you? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's good. thank you. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Um, as Megan said, um, my name is Amy Randon. I am a physical therapist at Children's Hospital, primarily working with uh, adolescents age really eight to, I'd say, 20 on a regular basis um, who are involved in sports. Um, I also have a master's degree in sport and performance psychology from DU. And so uh, I think, as Megan said, my passion is combining those two things because um, Anyone that's been in and around sports for any length of time knows that you can't have one without the other. And so um, being uh, in the field of work that I am in, um, I'm thankful that I've had the opportunity to uh, kind of specialize in both areas to provide the best um, treatment and um, care for my patients. So uh, with that, um, I'm so thankful to be here. So thank you for offering me this opportunity. Uh, performance anxiety is a fun topic because I think there's such a negative connotation that comes with um, with that thought, but there's actually, um, there's so much more to it and taking a slightly different viewpoint, it can actually um, work in your favor if you understand it a little bit more and have a little bit more self-awareness to how your body copes with things. So um, I'm thankful to have the opportunity to talk to you all tonight about this. Uh, and with, um, as Megan said, also use the chat as you feel uh, comfortable. As questions come up um, at the end, uh, we'll go through and answer um, as many of those questions as we have time to get to. So please don't hesitate to do that. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to start off, start off just exploring what is performance anxiety to you? Everyone's, uh, I would say coaches, players, parents, like everyone would probably describe it slightly differently, but then also describing how our body is programmed to handle stressful situations and then uh, increasing our own self-awareness um, on how pregame and performance nerves can impact your performance and play. Uh, I think one of the biggest things when looking at the mental side of sport is that awareness piece of just not so much 
the judging of is this right or wrong, but more just like, how am I feeling? What's going through my mind? How, how am I performing in this moment right now? Um, we're going to highlight the positive aspects of stress and nerves. And most times when I say that people look at me like I'm crazy, like there's something positive about being stressed or anxious. Um, there actually is. So we're going to talk about that today and then, uh, discuss, um, some keys to performing your best, uh, no matter the circumstance and offer techniques that you can start to rehearse in practice, uh, to improve your performance, um, on the court and games and, one of the big things that I like to also mention is a lot of what we talk about can be used not only in basketball, but at school, um, if you're working or in other aspects of life. So it's not just these basketball mental skills, it's, it's really life skills, but they can help in so many different ways. So um, normally if we were in person, I would take a moment and pull the group and say, you know, um, can you give me some examples of when you felt anxious or stressed while playing basketball for your, um, for this example? Um, just so since we can actually open that question up to the group, just take a minute and think about those things. Uh, was it during, you know, maybe a pregame when y'all are going through warmups and you feel the butterflies flying and your muscles start to tighten and you're just like, oh my goodness. Um, or was it standing at the free throw line with you know the team down by one and balls in your hand with a one and one? Um, there's so many different times when you may have these moments where you were like, oh my gosh, I was so stressed or I was so anxious in that moment. And I, and I was, or I wasn't able to perform in that moment. So just think back to some of those uh, examples that you may have. And um, you can kind of use that as almost like a working example through uh, a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today. I do have the formal definition of what performance anxiety is, but I also kind of broke it down in more, um, I think more my own terms to be completely honest. And it's when we tighten up, it's when our mouth is dry, uh, when you're feeling super stressed, but when there actually isn't danger in the moment. And so being able to kind of separate, um, you know, fears for safety versus fears for performance is, is a big piece as well. Um, being, this, being athletes, being students, being hopefully, you know, student athletes one day, whether it's in high school or college or beyond, um, we, all, we all face circumstances in life that can be stressful. So uh, learning how to manage these emotions um, when your thoughts start racing or your body becomes tense uh, can help you succeed really in any circumstance. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to put this quote in because I think it's a simple quote, but there's a lot there. And it's just something to kind of keep running through in your mind. Uh, there was an interview one time um, when an, a reporter asked Kobe, um, you know, what it is about, you know, his confidence or his ability to perform under pressure on the court. And he said, there's an infinite groove, whether you make a shot or miss the shot, it's inc inconsequential. So what's he saying? He's saying you're in this place. You're in this place that's absent of fear. You have total trust in yourself, no matter the outcome. Um, basically saying that you have done all the work to get to that point and you, you have full confidence, whether it works or not, because you know nothing's perfect, life isn't perfect. We're gonna miss you know, a large percentage of the shots we take, but also having that confidence in the moment to be able to so you know what, I've done the work, I'm ready, um, no matter what the circumstance is. Um, the whole other part that I really enjoy about this statement is um, there's, there's no doubt this, this statement is laced with confidence. So obviously Kobe has a lot of years and or had a lot of years and hours of practice um, under his belt, you know, more than any of us might have at this moment in time, but um, and realizing that He's a legend and having that ability to say this is huge, but also realizing that, you know, what if, what if we could get to that place where we have that total confidence and that is absent of fear. Um, so tell me, <laughs> what is confidence to you? Um, obviously don't, you don't have to necessarily tell me, but thinking about it when, you know, when your coach is like, I want you to be more confident or you're like, Hey, I want to be more confident. What is that to you? Because some, um, some of these concepts like mental toughness, some people, you know, throw the, throw that around a lot, but it's like, everyone has 
a slightly different definition of what that is and what that looks like. So I like to give you an opportunity to say, you know, what is, what is confidence to you? Um, is it, um, is it that knowing that no matter what you want the ball in your hand at the end of the game? Is it, um, uh, you know, no, knowing that you have put the work in and no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. Um, is it maybe a lack of confidence that you're like, I don't know if I have the ability to do this. Like when we say confidence, kind of what comes to mind in your, um, in your mindset, um, so holding those thoughts of uh, what we discuss in performance anxiety already, but then also we're going to make this shift and discuss confidence because those two things actually work um, really closely together. And so I like to at least give the foundation of both and then we see how they can come together here um, in a few minutes. <clears throat> so what is confidence? Um, like I said, everyone's definition can be slightly different. Uh, from a mental, mental performance side, we like to think of it as, um, as it's both actions and feelings. Uh, and we like to differentiate those two because sometimes um, we may feel confident and then still not be able to make the shot or we may not feel confident and still make the shot. And so um, being able to separate like what is the action of having that confidence internally and what is the feeling of being confident in the moment because no matter who you are, there's going to be days where that confidence just doesn't feel like it's there. But we still have to be able to show up and give our best effort and give our best performance when we're not feeling confident. Um, so taking this for a moment and, you know, thinking about the actions, trusting yourself, trusting your training, believing that you have within you what you need to perform whatever the task is. And I put task in there because I do want you to think of things outside of just basketball, but um, I know most of y'all might be thinking, you know, believing that you have the ability to make whatever shot it is that you have in your mind. Um, when I work with athletes individually or uh, in like a team setting, I, I ask them, I say, you know, if I were to show up to your game, how would I know what actions would I see in your body language, in your actions on the court? How would I know if you were acting confident that day. It doesn't mean cocky. <laughs> it means trusting you have, um, trusting you've put the work in, trusting that you're training, you know, whatever, you know, not slacking in practice. Each time you push harder, even if you're super tired, is giving you that, <clears throat> that ability to build that confidence, to know that you've put that work in, to know that you've got, um, you've got inside of you what you need to perform. Um, the reason we focus more on the actions is that's the stuff we have control over. Um, <clears throat> the feeling part, uh, it comes and goes. It's kind of fleeting. Um, thinking back to my own athletic career, there were days when I would walk out and um, I did not feel confident. And it's like somehow you still have to be able to perform and perform at your best when you don't feel great. Uh, thinking there's the, I don't have the picture or anything or a quote from it, but just thinking back to um, when Michael Jordan was super sick and had like, you know, 103 fever, probably shouldn't have been playing, but he was going to play no matter what, because it's Michael Jordan. Um, I don't know if he felt confident that night, you know, not feeling great, but at the same time to be able to go out and know that you've, you've done everything you can do and to be able to still put together the performance that, um, that he did. Uh, those are the kind of things where it, if, even if you're not feeling it, you still got to show up and do it. Your teammates need it. You owe it to yourself. All of those good things. Uh, so <clears throat> I like this visual. Um, it's actually from one of my professors uh, at school. Um, it seems su super simple, but it's actually pretty powerful. And uh, especially in those times when you're not feeling confident. It looks like um, I like to go through this just to kind of give you this visual so that um, on those days where you're not feeling great, this is this is kind of that thing mentally to think back on. Um, the feelings of confidence come and go. That's why it's the wave. Like there's sometimes you're super high and you feel great, and there's sometimes you're super low and you don't feel good. Um, but looking at the top line, your ability is your skill set and how good you are at that skill set. It is gradually improving. No matter where the wiggly line is, your ability continues to improve provided you're putting the work in. Um, 
So through training, through practice, through experience, you're honing your skills. <clears throat> and no matter what, you don't lose those skills. You don't lose all those hours of practice you've put in. So even on the days you might be at the bottom, the bottom dip of that confidence wave and you're not feeling great, still knowing where your ability lies and knowing that even if you don't feel good, you still have the ability to do the, to do the performance, to get on the court, to, um, you know, to, to show everyone all the work that you've been putting in. Um, <clears throat> so I like to think of all the practice, all the extra conditioning, whether you're watching film, additional training, all of that is deposits in the piggy bank. Uh, when we show up on game day, what's in the piggy bank is the culmination of all your hard work um, that you've done to prepare yourself. So I like to put these two things together because despite not feeling confident, if you remember how many deposits you've put in that piggy bank going into the game, the confidence piece almost goes out the window a little bit because you have, you have evidence to trust yourself um, because of all the hard work you've put in. Um, and then sometimes on the reverse, there's days where you're not feeling good at practice, but thinking about, hey, this is a day that even though I'm not feeling good, if I work hard, that's another deposit I can put in the piggy bank. So it's almost that motivating factor, but then also that rewarding factor um, when, uh, when you step on the court. Sometimes it's those tougher days in practice that when we get through them, um, you, uh, you, you gain confidence by pushing through when you, uh, you haven't necessarily always um, what am I trying to say there? I lost my train of thought. I apologize. Um, so you have the ability to perform on those days when, you know, you might not feel great knowing all the work that you've done to, um, to get to that point. Um, so we're taking another little sidestep away from both the performance anxiety and the confidence to talk about stress. Uh, as I said before, I like to discuss all three of these because they're all intertwined and sometimes different things resonate with different people. And I'd, uh, I'd really like for everyone to take, you know, the parts, there's some things that you're gonna be like, I don't really, that doesn't apply to me. It doesn't make sense to me. That's completely fine. But um, hopefully there's something you can take from each part to combine it to, um, give you those those tools when you're on the court in those tougher moments. Um, so um, stress. When I say stress, do you think it's good or bad? Uh, I would say on a regular day, if I ask that question, at least 75% of the hands go up and say it's bad. Like no one wants to feel stressed necessarily. But what's interesting is there's actually two different types of stress that we deal with in life. And what's even more fun is our body doesn't know the difference between good stress and bad stress because of the way our body reacts. And we'll go through all those things as well here in a minute. But just <clears throat> to put it out there, um, no matter good or bad, our body still internally and physiologically responds with the same type of chemicals internally. Um, and so, it's up to us really to determine whether it's a good, it's a good stressful situation or a bad stressful situation. So to start with the two different types, um, <clears throat> distress is what we mostly think of when we think of stress. It's the bad stress. It's when you're you're dealing with something difficult. It's hard to cope with. Um, it can be, you know, something on the court or something within your team, something within your family, something within your friends. There, there's, I mean, the stress in the world of all that, the changes that we're all living through right now, there's so much extra stress out there um, that it's, uh, we can't ignore it, it's there, but being able to identify when, you know, there's a lot of it and being able to take care of ourselves is super important because the side effects, as I have listed here, I'm not gonna go through them all specifically, but um, I think one of the biggest is that prolonged, prolonged bad stress can lead to physical illness, mental fatigue and emotional depletion. Um, <clears throat> that's important for us to, uh, to keep in mind simply because we have to know ourselves. And if things are getting super stressful, like being able to say, hey, look, I, I need to talk to somebody. That's okay. Um, it's not that it's a bad thing that you're feeling an exceptional amount of stress. Um, but it's also important if you're starting to feel stressed to be like, oh, okay, is this something that that is 
is truly bad or is this something where you know a game's not going our way and it's feeling like it's a bad type of stress but is there a way that we can turn it to make it a good type of stress for <clears throat> our bodies to uh to still be able to perform so you stress that's also known as the good stress um it's uh that's just the formal definition of the positive form of stress that happens when you're engaged in activity that is both exciting and motivating um Games can be exciting and motivating. They can be that good stress. You know, if you're in a close game and it's <laughs> super, um, it's against your rival, like that is that can be motivating. It can also be stressful in a, you know, maybe more of a negative way if you're putting a ton of pressure on yourself. Um, so being able to say, hey, look, I'm kind of feeling stressed right now. Like what, what am I feeling? Being able to separate those thoughts out and say, is this, something I can turn to my mind and be like, holy smokes, like I have the opportunity to play in this game. I have the opportunity to help my team to step up when <clears throat> we need it the most. You can kind of shift that from that fear almost, uh, it's almost like a fear induced stress on the court. Um, so being able to kind of shift it to the good stress, because as you can see here, there's a lot of positives that come from when our bodies are experiencing this. Uh, it does improve your performance. It does um, help motivate and focus your energy and feel invigorating. Um, so being able to, there's obviously there's times in life where you, you, can't, you can't shift it. I'm not saying that there are times where every time that you feel bad stress, you should be able to make a good stress. That's not the case. However, there are some times when we put a lot of pressure on ourselves um, to perform and to perform at our best and to, you know, judge ourselves pretty harshly that you can kind of shift that, um, that bad stress into that good stress by looking at it as the opportunity of what, what can we do in this moment? Um, so most people have probably heard of the fight or flight. That is that survival mechanism. When we have, uh, we have that, that stress and that flood of hormones into our body, um, this is what our body goes into. Uh, so the higher the level of stress, the more of those hormones, whether they're good or bad. Um, there's been times, you know, in life when something is so positive and so exciting that you can still feel some of those, um, some of those same bad feeling motions, um, uh, bad feeling emotions, um, because of how the body reacts to it. So, um, there are definitely times where you might feel like you're going into that mode and having to find that way to pull yourself out of those, um, exceptionally, uh, stressful moments, whether it's good or bad. Um, so like I mentioned, our body doesn't know the difference, um, which sometimes is a good thing. And sometimes, you know, might be a little bit more challenging. So, uh, what happens though, is when our body does hit that exceptional stress moment, um, good or bad, um, you have that increased heart rate, you have that increased metabolism, the adrenaline, you're breathing harder, uh, your hair, hair can stand up, um, the dry mouth that we talked about earlier. There's probably times in your life when you're like, holy smokes, I, I, I remember that. Some people it's, you know, standing up at school and giving a presentation um, that can actually, um, make that sympathetic system um, get a little bit more intense. However, um, how can we make the parasympathetic nervous system help that sympathetic side? So the, paras the sympathetic side is the fight or flight. It's like, oh my goodness, I have to save myself. The parasympathetic is like, hey, look, we got this. It's gonna be okay. So it's hard to play in your best performance if you are in that fight or flight uh, mode. It is very difficult. Some people thrive in that um, environment. I don't think it's the majority of people. Um, the parasympathetic system, once you kind of build that one up a little bit, which uh, we'll talk through how to do that, um, that's, when, uh, that's when you can kind of start to get into your flow and your muscles are relaxed. You're seeing the court. You don't feel like you're in that, just that tunnel vision of um, I don't want to say panic, but sometimes it feels like, feels like almost like a panic place. Um, but it gives you that opportunity to just, you're still intense, you're still working hard, but your brain has slowed down a little bit so that you can actually continue to perform at your best. Um, 
So like I said, is your fight, fight or flight instinct a bad thing? No, it's actually not. Um, if you've got those butterflies before the game, um, it's actually your body's way of getting, is telling you that what you're about to do is important. It wants you to be prepared. It wants you to, um, to be able to, to perform at your best. And so, um, so once that sympathetic system kicks in, obviously things, uh, things narrow, it's preparing you for battle, but being able to still pull yourself out of that just a little bit enough to be able to focus is still the important part. Um, so like I said, butterflies are not a bad thing. Some people are like, oh my gosh, I have butterflies. I can't focus. That is the first step to the awareness of being like, okay, now I realize that. How, how am I going to fix this? Um, how am I going to work through this and help my butterflies fly in formation? Um, those are, that's why there's two, those two pictures there because the, uh, the cluster of butterflies, that is more of, um, you know, that uncontrolled stress before a game or at the free throw line uh, when the game's on the line, feeling that. How do we get ourselves to the point where it's like, hey, I know I feel these butterflies, but I'm actually going to use them to my advantage and help them fly information. Um, so like I said, there's different types. Our goal is to perform in that, in that good stress. Um, no stress, you kind of don't really care about anything. So it's hard to actually get yourself amped up. Distress, too much distress is, um, is exhausting because your body is working so hard just to remain in that moment. Um, that's why our goal is to shift, um, is to shift more to that middle line, just simply because that will enhance our performance, having the right amount of stress um, or feeling the right amount of stress in our body. Um, so before we keep going, I just wanted to pause, um, and give you an opportunity. You can jot it down. Uh, you can think about it. You can put it in your phone. Uh, what are the three things that you've taken away from say the last 25, 30 minutes that we've been talking, um, that you want to remember moving forward where the next section is going into how do you mentally, uh, cope through or work through, um, all the different types of stresses that we talked about and what kind of skills you can start to prepare in um, pre prepare for and practice to help you in games. But before we get there, I do want to just kind of push pause and say, hey, you know, what have you taken away from this? And what kind of things um, do you feel like kind of hit home with you that uh, you'll want to remember um, in the next, you know, days, weeks, months, or years? So take a moment and do that. All righty, so moving forward. Um, maybe you've had this experience, maybe you haven't, I don't know, but there's been times when athletes have said, you know, what, what do I do? What do I do when I'm struggling a little? And I feel like coach is always on my back for certain skills and it's all the time. And I feel like I'm, I'm working so hard, but it, it, you know, doesn't feel like it's getting anywhere. Like, what do we do in that moment? Um, has anyone ever heard of the growth mindset? If you haven't, if you have, awesome. I would, uh, I would uh, encourage you to share with your friends what you know about it because it can simply be a flip of the switch in your brain. Um, and if you can share that with your friends or your teammates, I think that can be super helpful um, for everyone to continue to grow and evolve as an athlete and as a person. If you haven't heard about it, don't worry, we're gonna go through it. Um, so taking this for a moment, um, uh, don't worry so much about all the words. If you want to read through them, absolutely go ahead. But we're going to kind of talk through the, uh, four different or the five different kind of segments that the growth mindset is, um, is built upon. Um, so I'm going to ask you a few questions. Remember, there's no right answer, no wrong answer. Don't judge yourself. Don't, you know, <laughs> internally think about what should I be saying right now? Like, just think internally, you know, where do I, where, how would I answer this question? Um, 
And uh, there might be some areas where you're like, oh, that might be an area that I need to work on. There might be other areas where you're like, hey, I got this, no worries on that one. Um, so to start with, we look at challenges. So do you welcome challenges when they come to you or, um, or do you kind of shy away from them? Like I said, neither one is right or wrong. It's more just to start to gain that self-awareness. Uh, with a growth mindset, um, you know that challenges are required for you to get better at whatever the skill, the task is. And challenges ultimately help you grow and develop as an athlete, as a person, as a student. Um, so taking that first bullet point of the challenges, where do you kind of fall on that spectrum? Now, the second one is obstacles. Um, do you look at obstacles as they're this firm and in place uh, thing that's holding you back from achieving your goals or your dreams? Or are obstacles just opportunities of things that need to be solved? And that these new problems are just evidence that you're continuing to grow and get better. Um, so when you come upon an obstacle, how do you, how does that make you feel? Is it exciting? Because once you overcome it, you're like, holy smokes, I overcame it. Or is it like, oh, that, that, that's going to be a tough one. I don't know if I can get past that. Like I said, nothing is right or wrong. Just kind of, it's more of that awareness of where we are. Um, then the next one. So we've gone through challenges, obstacles. We're going to talk about effort now. Um, are you someone that thinks if I work hard, my efforts will pay off and I'll achieve my goals and desires? Or... Are you somebody that thinks um, no matter how hard I work, uh, nothing's going to change? So that's why it says my abilities are unchanging on that fixed mindset side. I'm either good or I'm not. Um, if uh, if that's that's where you are, maybe try and shift and say you know hard work. Um, like find some friends or some. Um, or examples of people that you know that have worked hard and overcome some stuff just to help you see that that hard work can help you um, can help you get not only get better in terms of your abilities, but it can help uh, prepare you for, you know, when those challenges and those obstacles do arise. Um, and then criti the next one's criticism. So ob challenges, obstacles, effort, criticism is the fourth one. Um, do you seek feedback and accept that? as someone helping you grow and become a better athlete or student or whatever it is? Or do you see that that feedback as more criticism and, um, and kind of take it more personally? One of the greatest things sometimes can be like going up to your coach and saying, hey, you know, I need feedback on why, you know, I didn't perform this as well as I thought I could have. Or coach, you know, what do you, um, what do you think I could do better in this particular um, position or this particular uh, play or setup that we're working on? Asking for that feedback will give you um, hopefully steps, whether it's from, from parents, from coaches, from friends, whoever it's from, will hopefully help give you those, those tools that say, hey, look, it's an area that, you know, that I can work on that can help me get better versus, um, saying, hey, uh, it doesn't, you know, they're, they're attacking me as a person. Usually that's not the case. Sometimes it feels that way, but um, try to see whatever feedback is coming your way as constructive and actually trying to help you grow as, um, as, as an individual. And then finally, success is the final piece. Um, when other people succeed, do you feel more inspired or more intimidated? With a growth mindset, you're looking at the other successes as, uh, as positives. You want others to succeed because it gives you, whether it's someone ahead of you, it gives you that next level to, you know, to work towards, to continue to hone your own efforts if you're trying to achieve something. Um, but uh, so those are just the five. Um, there's a lot online. And um, Carol Dweck is a psychologist that has uh, basically devoted her career to this. So there's a ton of, ton of resources online. Uh, if there's coaches that are watching that, um, that can kind of help, uh, help you work with your athletes um, on some of these things, if there's certain aspects that your athlete may or may not be struggling with. Um, so 
Now, talking about slowing the butterflies. So when you have, um, you have your, you know, you're at the free throw line, game's on the line, uh, and the ball's in your hands. You have butterflies. It's not like, oh gosh. I mean, if they get out of control, arms might tense up. It might be tough to shoot, or at least have the smoothest shot that um, that you could potentially have. But in that moment, while you're taking your um, your dribbles just to get yourself set, um, take a moment and breathe. Our breath has so much control over that calming system that we talked about. Your parasympathetic nervous system is actually, your breath is connected to that. So that is how you can start to slow the butterflies in that moment. So there's a pretty formal way to do it, but if um, the goal is more to just slow it down, it doesn't have to be, um, oops, sorry. It doesn't have to be, um, uh, this, you know, the four, the two, the four, the two, if you, if you can do that and stay focused in that moment and take those, take the time to do it, that's great. Um, the biggest thing is slowing your breathing, especially after you've been, you know, a full court press running back and forth for how, who knows how long at this point, um, your heart rate, your, your breathing, it's, it's all out of control. So being able to take that moment and kind of settle yourself by taking a few deep breaths can help, um, slow that, that internal stress system down so that you can actually still perform in that, um, in that state of uh, enhanced pressure or maybe additional stress. Um, that picture is old. I apologize. That picture is not changed from a dance presentation that I've done in the past. Um, so building confidence. This is something that um, I like to discuss because it is, uh, it can be so powerful. Um, most people have heard of some type of visualization or imagery. Um, the reason those things help and give your body um, the chance to have reps without physically doing it is because of this super formal theory that sometimes I have trouble pronouncing. Um, they've done a lot of research in terms of how the brain and the nervous system and the muscular system are connected. Uh, what they have found is the ability for your brain to, you know, um, visualize, imagine, walk yourself through a skill, a play, a point in the game ahead of time. It actually takes stress off of the body when you find yourself in that position. So I keep going back to the same example. It's just an easy one. And I'm sure most people have been in that position at some point in their career where you do have the ball in your hand and the game is on the line. Um, being able to say, oh my goodness, I've done this in my brain so many times. I know the, I know that I can do this. I know that I can perform this outcome. Um, it's the, the body doesn't know the difference, which is really cool, which uh, sometimes, you know, physically our bodies can break down if we you know, practice for 20 hours a day. However, uh, if you combine some of that visualization with the physical practice, your body will be more prepared for when you are in that moment. Um, also the, so that's one part is doing imagery, doing visualization. The more real you can make those moments in your mind, the more real your body and the more your body will believe the actual, um, truth in that moment. So, um, so if you're in a particular gym, visualizing what does that gym look like? Is the crowd filled? What noises are the crowd is the crowd making? Is it an exciting noise? Is it more of a depressing noise? Are they? Is it quiet? Um, feeling the sweat running down, you know, your skin. Feeling, uh, um, you know, what is the what does the gym smell like? Feeling the ball in your hands. The more you can make it as real as possible, the more your body will begin to. Um, begin to uh, trust and believe that actual um, you performing that skill in this, the environment and the circumstances that you're visualizing. Uh, the confidence assignment. <laughs> um, I like people to think about a time when, uh, and you can write all these down um, on your own now, later, whatever works for you. Um, I like you to write down a time when you felt confident and you performed well. What did that look like? 
And then I like when you write down a time when you didn't perform, you didn't feel confident and you still performed well. And the third point is what is consistent through those two? What, um, what were you able to do when you were confident and perform well? And then what were you still able to do when you weren't confident, but you still performed well? Um, that way on those days where, you know, you might not feel great, you still have, um, you have evidence of, of why your body and your mind are ready, ready to perform based on the actions. And um, like I said earlier, just try to stick to the actions. What kind of things did you do? Because like we said, those feelings, they can come and go, but the actions are what we can, um, we can consistently bring forward. Um, so we're now we're going to talk about self-talk because this goes, um, this goes hand in hand with, with the confidence, with, um, managing that performance anxiety, um, and, um, and the stress as well. So, um, if we were in person, we would talk through some examples, um, in, since we're not, I've put together um, a few here that we're just gonna go through one by one. I don't like to talk about positive and negative self-talk because some things that might be super positive for one person might be super negative for someone else. So I like to think of it um, individually as productive versus not productive. Um, so if you're telling yourself something and actually starting to listen to what's going on in your mind, determining like, is this something that's helping me? Is this productive? Or if you're saying something in your mind, then you're like, is this helping me or is this actually hurting my performance and it's unproductive? So we're just gonna go through these um, uh, real quick. So I've got this, like balls in your hand, I've got this, that's, that's productive. Um, he or she is better than me. That's one that might be more unproductive because we're kind of getting stuck in that comparison, which we can't focus on our best performance if we're comparing ourselves to someone else. Um, I always miss free throws. Uh, that's unproductive. Our body <laughs> believes what our brain tells us. And so if we continue to tell ourselves these things, our body will basically follow through because our brain has told ourselves these things so many times. I love the opportunity to compete. That's productive. Um, knowing that uh, there are times when it is stressful, but knowing that you love being in that moment is, uh, is great to tell yourself. Uh, so especially when it is stressful, because if you love to be there, it's um, your body will feel more of that gut, good stress versus that bad stress. And then I want the ball when the game's on the line. That's productive. If you're telling yourself, I don't want the ball, I don't, coach, don't put me in, I don't want the ball. If you're not saying that out loud, but you're saying it in your head, and then coach puts you in and the ball's in your hand, but you've been telling yourself, I don't want it, I don't want it. Um, that might not end as, um, as successful as it would if you've been telling yourself that you actually do want the ball and you believe you want the ball when the game's on the line. Um, what about I'm always so tense when I take this shot? That's like I said um, earlier, that, that's unproductive as well. Finding uh, what are some, I'd say in the next week or so, just at practice, what are some things that you find yourself telling yourself? Our, we like to call it our internal chatter. <laughs> um, what, what's going on between your ears? has so much power over what our body actually does. So um, it's important to kind of uh, get a handle on that so that you can actually start to control the things that are within your control while you perform. Um, I saw this quote um, from Kobe and I thought it was appropriate for this point in this presentation. Um, if you're afraid to fail, you probably are going to. That that fear that continues that to come up with someone that, you know, has faced a lot of stressful situations in his life, um, but still being able to step up to the plate or I guess the line, not the plate, um, step up to the line and perform um, is super important because of the mental game that he possessed while he played. So with all of that, um, just to review what we've talked about tonight, because I know I went through a lot in about 45 minutes. Um, so the anxiety and the confidence link, those two things can be, um, can be so intertwined sometimes that uh, it's important to be able to kind of separate those um, or to know the difference between those in your mind. 
and think through um, how can you handle the situation slightly differently. And the stress, knowing that it can be good or bad, um, and our body's going to respond internally the exact same way. So being able to kind of shift when it might feel bad, it might be stemming from unproductive thoughts, or it might be actually something stressful, being able to say, hey, look, this is something I have control over that I can shift into the good stress. Um, and being able to mentally do that um, can be very beneficial. Um, the growth mindset, that part, we definitely, um, it's, a, it's an important part just uh, for growth as a player, for growth um, in school, just because there's, there's so much that life throws at us that we're not expecting. And if you can prepare yourself mentally for all of the unknowns ahead, um, we can't prepare for every situation, but if we prepare ourselves for the unknown, it can be very beneficial. Uh, the benefits of the secret weapon, which I like to call your breath, there's, uh, there's so much research out there about how um, controlling your breath controls your internal state and um, helps with performance. And then the visualization imagery and self-talk that we went through, all of those things are awesome um, and can help you on the basketball court. But as I mentioned earlier, the biggest thing I wanna stress is that this, this can help in so many areas of life. Um, and the more reps you get in starting to kind of uh, prepare your mind um, on the court or uh, or off the court, really, uh, you'll start to see that it overlaps and that some stressful situations in life that might have used to cause these super anxiety provoking, you actually have a little bit more um, control over in those moments. Um, so it's kind of fun to start to see it seeping into other parts of your life. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you again for this opportunity. I have my email on the bottom of the slide. So if anyone has any more specific questions that we don't get to in the, um, in the chat, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email or if you're looking for additional resources, I am absolutely happy to share, um, to share anything. Um, so with that, I'm going to pull up the chat and see, um, oh, the previous slide. I am so sorry. Um, I'm just seeing that now. Um, I don't know what slide that is. <laughs> if you want to type specifically what that slide is, I'm happy to go back. Um, um, so someone asked, uh, interested in the physiological aspects that kick in when your body responds to anxiety. Um, in the moment of serving a tennis match, landing a ski jump or making a free throw. Um, that might be something we talked about a little bit later. Um, and this question might be from earlier, but the physiological aspects are the, um, the increased heart rate, the increased respiratory rate, which is basically how much you're breathing, the increased muscle tension. Um, all of those things can kick in, which is why, um, the f f acknowledging that you're in that more of a heightened stressful state. And, you know, one of the ba more basic uh, go-tos is the breathing, being able to use your breath to slow all of those things so that you can actually perform. Um, then let's see what else we got here. Um, the name of the resource. Um, the book that Carol Dweck wrote is called Mindset, but there's also, if you just type in growth mindset on Google or her name, which is Carol, and then her last name is Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, there's a ton that can, um, that pops up with, uh, with good resources just to refer back to. Um, and then the self-fulfilling prophecy, um, sometimes there's actually a lot of, um, there's a lot that goes into, uh, they use other words to describe it, but it's basically the same thing. There's so much that, it, that if we're telling ourselves the same message all the time, that's some, that can be what transpires. That's why we wanna shift that message to a more, um, a more positive or productive, I guess using the correct word, a more productive place um, so that uh, you can, um, so that you can actually uh, fulfill all your goals and dreams. 
Um, and if not, to still be able to know that you gave it, uh, you gave it your all. Uh, and that can be just as, re just as rewarding to know that you put everything out there. You did all the work and, you know, sometimes, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's, um, there's, uh, there's nothing guaranteed, but the best we can do is set ourselves up um, both physically and mentally to be successful. Um, and the effects of stress on sport, that's the slide. Let me go back to that, that somebody, whoops, asked for, let me see if I can get back there. Uh, effects of stress, uh, it might be this one, um, or maybe it's this one. Um, so the effects of stress, basically saying that as our physiological state um, gets more amped up, if it gets too amped up, those butterflies are out of control and we can't actually control, um, control our focus, control our muscle tension, um, and ultimately control our performance. So being able to acknowledge when we start to get to that stressful state, doing some breathing, doing self-talk, going through visualization, you know, before you even let the ball release out of your hands, all of those things can help move you out of that exceptionally stressed place into the good stress place to improve the overall performance. Um, Alrighty, um, I think that's all the questions. And like I said, let me get back to um, my email. So if anyone else has more specific questions, I am more than happy um, to, to respond to those. So just let me know. Thank you again um, for this opportunity as well. Thank you, Mimi, that was awesome. Um... So we will be sending out a recording of this too, if anybody wants um, to review it again. And also we will be sending out the whole slideshow presentation. So if there's a slide that you miss that you're um, interested in, we'll be sending that um, via email as well. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, I do know we our next speaker series is set on the calendar for March 16th. And that one we'll be talking about um, your inner coach. So Mimi kind of touched on that very briefly, but they'll go more into depth on that. So we'll, we'll be getting information up on our website here um, probably by the end of the week. So um, spread the word. We hope to uh, see you again if you'd like. And again, if you have any questions or comments um, that don't pertain to this, just to the health huddle in general, you can send an email to healthhuddle at goldcrownfoundation.com. So thanks everybody. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.